Mm. And some people also saw the call out and then would share it with their friends or with people that they thought would be really cool to interview. Like I had a friend who introduced me to her neighbor because her neighbor was a dominatrix. Some of the really cool interviews were because people knew about the project and they were like, oh, you have to speak to that person. Today's guest comes all the way from Africa. Nanata Kwasa Jerma has such a cool story about how she used her blog as a launch pad to publishing her first book, not just in the UK, but also in the US as well. She talks all about the interview process and also how listening back to her interviews and transcribing them actually helped her craft each narrative. Because sometimes in transcribing, I would literally hear something that I hadn't quite heard when we had the conversation or I hadn't quite sank in. So I could go back and like have a second conversation. And also in transcribing, I would also hear what in a sense was the most interesting parts of the story. So that is when the crafting of the story would come to me. Nana shares all about how she went from blog to book, including writing a book proposal, how she landed her agent, her best tips for writers trying to get published, and more in today's episode. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Welcome to The Bleeders, a podcast and support group about book writing and publishing. I'm writer and podcaster Courtney Kosak, and each week I'll bring you new conversations with authors, agents, and publishers about how to write and sell books. My name is Nanada Kosichiyama. I'm the author of The Sex Lives of African Women, also co-founder of Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, blog, podcast, and live festival about sex, sexualities, and pleasure. I got to know today's guest through my other podcast, Private Parts Unknown. And on that show, we had Nana on and had a great conversation about the content of her book. And today on The Bleeders, we're now going to talk shop about the book writing and publishing logistics. And also, I just want to say, I love how this conversation calls back to one of the big takeaways from my interview with Bridget Bianca. All writing is valid. Yay. Okay. I'm so excited for this conversation. And especially since I got a little preview during Private Parts Unknown. In that interview, we talked about like what the book was. And now we're going to talk about how you did it, how you made it happen. So I'm really pumped. But first, let's do the lightning round questions. So when did you first identify as a writer? I think I began to feel confident enough to think I could possibly call myself a writer one day. In 2012, I had gone to a writing workshop run by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Hopefully some of your listeners would have heard of her because she's actually Uh quite famous. Right. And she runs this writing workshop every year in Nigeria. And I went there and I really felt affirmed in that workshop. At the time, I'd been blogging for three years about sex and sexualities through my blog, Adventures in the Bedrooms of African Women. But I think there was a part of me that just thought, okay, that's not proper writing. That's just blogging. (laughs) That's just me, you know, like vomiting on a virtual page. Was it something about the topic that made it seem not legit too? Yes, I think it was the topic. I think it was a topic. And there's a part of me that felt to be a legitimate writer, surely I have to write about other things. So at, po- at some point in time, I expressed that hesitation. And to my mind, was like, no, your writing is very important. It needs to be out in the world. And the publisher of Farafina, which is a local publisher in Nigeria, also said exactly the same thing. And he was like a conservative older man. So I was just like, okay, if these two people are telling me that what I'm writing is valid, then it really is valid. I guess sometimes you just get the affirmation that you need to hear, right? Uh And I think that was when I thought, okay, I can start to think of myself as a writer. Beautiful. I love that 10-year journey. Okay, we're going to cover that in a second. (laughs) But first, what's your all-time favorite book? Mm, I have to say, gosh... It's hard, but I have to say a book that really just came into my life at the right time was All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes by Maya Angelou. 
Oh. So it's one of the one of the books in her autobiography. My Angelou was, I think, super, super smart and like just dividing her autobiography into several books. And Olga's Children Need Traveling Shoes was like, it wasn't the first, maybe not even the second. I think it was like the third, right? And the time that I read that book, I was living in the UK and I went to a bookshop that no longer exists called Borders, went right to the end of the bookshop, which is where they tended to put their black books. And I was just sort of looking at the covers and I saw this book and like the title really just struck me. So I picked it up, started leaving through, and I realized that my Angelo had actually spent some time living in Ghana. Oh. You know, and I was a Ghanaian living in the UK. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to read this book. I read it. I loved it. I went back and just started reading her autobiography in order. And her work for me is really transformational. That book was transformational because it spoke about the importance of women being able to move in the world, being able to travel. You know, she described scenes like going to a bar, like drinking cocktails, giving the bartender big fat tips. And that really stayed with me. (laughs) That's always been my dream. And I don't think I've ever done it, but to go like dress up to the nines, go sit in a bar, have a really fancy cocktail and like tip the bartender really, really heavily so he keeps the drinks coming. You know, I think I was like the kind of badass woman my (laughs) Angela was and the kind of badass woman I want to be. Amazing. I love that. I actually haven't read that one of hers, so I need to go look at that. I highly recommend. What's your dream writing routine? Like if money was no object, if time was no object, what would be your dream routine? Okay, so first of all, it'll be in a house that I own on the beach, right? But it's going to be, the house is going to be set about, let's say, like it'll take you like two minutes to walk to the beach. I don't want to be right on the beach because, you know, like the waves can destroy the house. And it's going to be a two-story house, okay? And my writing room will be on the top floor, facing a huge window. And from my window, I can see the horizon, And then I'll occasionally see fishing boats come and pass. And the room will be like cream, painted cream, quite simple, quite stark. On one side will be a whiteboard. And on another side will be like a cork board, right? The kind of board that you can post pens for. And the whiteboard will be just for like writing and scribbling ideas. And the only thing that will be in the room will be a desk, a chair, a laptop, which only has like, It doesn't have emails. It doesn't have anything, right? Somehow, it's because I like to write in Google Docs. It's like Google Docs without the email attached. Ooh. (laughs) You're speaking my language, all this. I'm like, yes, I'll have the house next door. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's my dream writing routine. Um, Okay, so what does it look like in real life? What's your real writing routine? Uh, Why do you want to bring me back to reality? I still want to stay in the dream. (laughs) I know. (laughs) <laughs> so the reality it looks like setting my lamp for 5.15 a.m. And then around 5.30, 5.45, sitting up in bed to write for like an hour and a half before like I go for a walk and start my day. Ah. And it's not a bad routine, I have to say. I quite like that one too. I would just prefer the house on the beach. Yeah. So I didn't realize you're a mom, right? I am. Yes. Yes. Yeah, a mom of so- a two-year-old. With a two-year-old, I imagine like you do have to steal that time. You know what I mean? That time in the morning that's like precious and just yours. Does it feel like that? Um, You know, like I've had to like really work around this because the thing is my two-year-old, I had to literally give up on sleeping with her most of the time Uh, because she refuses to sleep on her own. So that was actually my writing routine before she came into my life. So I have a living nanny and when the living nanny is around, You know, my two-year-old's room is next door to my nanny's for a reason. Like I gave up on my office Uh so she could have a so she could have a room of her own so that I can start to claim back some of my time. Yeah, but when I sleep with my two-year-old, I cannot wake up and write because the minute you get out of bed, she wake up as well. So you kind of have to just lie by her. Yeah. (laughs) Greedy children. (laughs) I know. (laughs) One piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it. Every single thing at which Dante Cat has ever written just makes me jealous. Say the name one more time. I missed that. At which Dante Cat. She's a Haitian American writer. Oh, I don't know her. Yeah. She writes both fiction and nonfiction. You have to look her up. I mean, she's 
she's also written an incredible book for, I think, all writers and creatives called Create Dangerously. But just in general, her fiction is powerful. Her nonfiction is powerful. And she writes very much about social issues as well in terms of her fiction. And it, but it's so immersive. It just draws you in. It also gives you context to some of the, you know, some of the, the geopolitical issues in places like Haiti in the Dominican Republic. She's just an incredible, incredible writer. Oh, that's a good wreck. Okay, so now let's dig in to the book and the blog. So you identified as a writer back in 2012. And from my understanding, it kind of started with the blog. So tell us about your jumping off point, like how the blog got started and how that brought you to the point where you were like, okay, it's book time. So the blog really came out of a beach holiday. I'm clearly obsessed with beaches, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just ahead of my 30th birthday, I went on a beach holiday with a group of other women, other African women. And we spent a lot of time, like you do, sitting around, drinking cocktail after cocktail. And, you know, the conversation would turn to sex. But then it felt to me like this conversation was really different. It felt to me like people could be really open, honest, non-judgmental. People were talking about their desires, fantasies. And some of those women were women I had met for the re- for the first time. Mm. So I came from the holiday thinking, like, why has it taken me so long to feel like I can have this kind of community that has this really positive attitude about sex? And, you know, I felt inspired that I wanted to start a blog about sex. So I rang up one of my very good friends, Malika Grant. She lived in the States at the time. And I said to her, you know what? I want to start a blog about sex. She coincidentally had been interviewing her own grandmother about her sex life. And so she was thinking of writing a book, you know, called Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. And I said to her, let's do a blog and later on we can turn it into a book. And that's what we did. Like she also wrote two series that she started on the blog that became Mm -hmm. books. So we both have, in a sense, books that have been inspired by some of the some of the writing we've been doing on the blog. So around 2014, I thought There's so many interesting stories on the blog, but these are stories I never see anywhere else. You know, I actually want to just reach out to many African, Afro-descendant and Black women across the world and ask them about the experiences of sex and sexuality and turn that into a book, which is how the sex lives of African women came into being. I guess first, let's, before we go any further, just give a quick premise of the book, how many people you interviewed, etc. So the book, The Sex Lives of African Women, is basically a nonfiction book about African women's experiences in regards to like sex, sexualities, and pleasure. And what I did was interviewed women from all across the world in the continent, right? So like Nigeria, Sao Tome, the United Kingdom, the United States, Barbados, And then I retold everybody's story in the first person because I really wanted people to connect with those stories. The book is divided into three broad sections, self-discovery, freedom, and healing. And there's about like 30 stories in there? Yes, yes. So 31 or 32 including myself, my own stories included in there. Okay, so I love the book. And then I was looking on your blog and I saw what was maybe the first call for interviews. So I would love to know, Ah. yeah, how that started. And it was like, you know, I have a hundred questions about the sex lives of African women and I hope you can help answer them. So tell us a little bit about how you cast these people. Oh, you really did your research. You're the very first person who has Uh actually interviewed me and has done that. So that's incredible. (laughs) Yes. So I basically did a call out on the blog, right? Saying, I want to do this book. I said, I want to interview people about the experiences of sex. I think I said it was for a book, you know, like who wants to be interviewed? And I had a, I remember the first time I did it, I had a ton of people respond and I just wasn't ready, you know? So actually I feel like there's a whole bunch of people I probably never responded to. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But then I actually started to interview people. The very first person I interviewed was somebody who randomly slid into my DM on Twitter because they were confused about their own sexuality. Ah. So I found myself, you know, kind of like, you know, trying to reassure them, like, 
sexuality is on the spectrum and you know if you're attracted to women it doesn't necessarily mean that you're lesbian or you're bi like you can take time to figure out who you are and you, maybe you don't uh-huh. even need to figure out who you are right like and then eventually I was like I'm writing a book about sex can I interview you and she said yes so she came over to my house and we, the first time we just sort of drank some wine and just chit-chatted and then the second time we drank some more wine and then actually <laughs> did the interview. And then we had a third interview where, you know, like we went a bit deeper into the conversation. And then what I would do then was as I traveled and I used to travel a lot pre-pandemic for my for my job, everywhere I went, I'll try and just find somebody to interview. You know, so I went to Costa Rica and I was like, oh, my gosh. There are black people in Costa Rica. I need to interview uh-huh. someone here, you know. So that was basically my process. And some people also saw the call out and then would share it with their friends or with people that they thought would be really cool to interview. Like I had a friend who introduced me to her neighbor because her neighbor was a dominatrix. So nice. some of the really cool interviews were because people knew about the project and they were like, oh, you have to speak to that person. And some people just like inboxed me on Facebook. One of my favorite stories in the book is the story by Helen Banda. She just inboxed me on Facebook and I didn't see it for three months because I never go on Facebook. People don't message me on Facebook. <laughs> like I might not ever too. see it. Don't send that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I kind of saw it three months later and I was like, oh my gosh, like you're in a polyamorous marriage and I, I want to interview you. So then I was frantically trying to call her on Facebook Messenger, later sent her a message. She responded. We had a conversation. Yeah. You had such interesting identities and perspectives that you cover in the book. So I'm curious, was there anybody that you're like, okay, you're too vanilla? Or were you able to kind of like find a story out of everyone? I found a story out of almost everybody. There was just one person whose story I didn't include. And that was because there wasn't a lot of sex in the conversation Uh. we had, right? And in all fairness, at any other point in time in my process, I would have gone back and had a second interview with her. Uh Because when I said to her, I'm sorry, I've thought about it. I can't really include it. There wasn't a lot of sex. She was like, oh, we can have another conversation. And at any other point in time, I'd have said yes, but I was really close to deadline. And I was at Uh that stage where I was pretty much done with my own book, right? I was ready to send it to the publisher and never see it again. Right. You know, (laughs) (laughs) So that was literally the only story I didn't include. And for me, that really speaks to the fact that I feel like almost everybody has an interesting story when it comes to sex. Like it's such a fascinating subject. I could never get tired of writing about it. And I feel like even vanilla sex lies are super interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I agree. I don't think you need to have this wild swinging off the ceiling kind of sex life to be in a book about sex. Like I interviewed people who were celibates, for instance, at the premise or at the top of it, you might think, oh, there isn't much. But then it's really interesting to hear why somebody's chosen to be celibate, what that's doing for them, how that's part of their healing, you know, what sex looks like for someone who is celibate. Are they masturbating? Are they not masturbating? All of these things. Right? <laughs> it's an endlessly fascinating subject. So when you went to do the interviews, were you like, okay, I'm asking everyone all these same questions? Or were you like, okay, I know this person's a dominatrix. I want to figure out everything about their life as a dominatrix. Were they more tailored? Mm, It was definitely tailored, yes. So when I first started, I did a mixture of things. The sort of consistent question I would always ask people was how they identified in terms of the agenda Mm -hmm. and how they identified in terms of their sexual orientation. And how old they were, right? Um, Those kind of three questions were super important to me to have some consistency across. Because initially, I was really interested in, can I see any sort of patterns and trends and Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff? And when I first started, I also used to ask people, what's your earliest sexual memory? Mm -hmm. And I stopped asking that question because I was triggering people to tell me a lot about the experience of child sexual abuse, you know? And it took me a while to realize, oh, this is the question that's making everybody go there, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's also not really something that I wanted to hear all of the time. And I didn't necessarily want to trigger it unless somebody wanted to speak about it, right? That makes a lot of sense. Did you do a book proposal for this? I did. Yes, I did a book proposal. 
tell me about that stage. What was that like and how far along in the process were you? And did things really change after that or was it pretty close? I did a book proposal when I really wanted to look for an agent. And because I'm a nonfiction writer, I knew that the key thing would be the book proposal. The key thing would also be able to point to the fact that I am the person who is an authority on this subject and can write this type of book. Well, I'd been asking like some of my writer friends if they knew agents who might be interested in my work. And one of my writer friends actually connected me to the person who eventually became my agent. So that's also my biggest tip <laughs> for people who want to be published, like make writer friends, you know? I think it's, it really helps because they're already in the industry. Mm-hmm. They've already been published. They may be willing to introduce you to their own agent or they may have other agents who like come into their purview. So this writer friend, actually I can mention his name. His name is Suleiman Adonai. He runs a literary festival called the Asmara Addis Literature Festival in Excel, which takes place every year in Brussels. And my agent had been to that festival and he knew I was looking for representation. So afterwards, he just wrote to me and was like, oh, you know, this agent was at my festival. Would you like me to introduce you? I said, yes. I sent him my proposal. And then literally three days later, he responded saying, I've read it. I love it. I think I can sell it. Can we speak? Yay. Yes. And that's how I got my agent. And had you already started interviewing when you did the proposal or was it something you were going to do in the future? No, I had already interviewed at the time about 10 or 11 people and I'd actually written 10 or 11 chapters already. Oh. So I also was able to give yeah details of the 10 slash 11 people I'd already interviewed. And I also spoke then about the other interviews and the other types of people I wanted to include in the book. Yeah, so I was already very clear about the format and, in a sense, the breadth of stories that I wanted to tell. Nice. Okay. So we'll come back to your agent selling the book. Unless, Mm. did he do it right right away or no? Oh, yes. Once we actually signed, within three weeks, he had sold the book. What? Two to three weeks, yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. What was that process like? It was interesting. Like, I was surprised it kind of happened so quickly. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I was surprised it happened so quickly. And so when he finally came back to me with an offer, you know, one of the things he said to me, I'm in the UK, I'm published by Dialogue Books, which is part of Little Brown UK. And he was, one of the things he said to me is the publisher is called Charmaine. And he was like, Charmaine works really hard for her authors. That really stayed in my head, right? Nice. And I have found it to be true. Because I have friends who have been published by, you know, like the big five and they may get really big advances. But to be honest, their books get published and no one ever hears about it. And I feel like my publishing house has worked really hard to make sure that my books are on bookshelves around the world. Amazing. Okay. So going back to the process of writing the book, after you had done the interview, what was the process of turning them into a story? How much did you editorialize and kind of like add your own voice to it? So for me, because it's a nonfiction book, it was really, really important to be telling a true story, right? So my process was quite intense. I'd interview people and then I would transcribe. So initially I was transcribing like literally every word myself. And then I was like, this is taking forever. And uh-huh. so I started to transcribe with a robot, but then I would still <sighs> listen and correct every single mistake. And it was like the most frustrating process, I but know. it was really helpful. <laughs> it was also really helpful because then I would really hear the story. Uh-huh. Because sometimes in transcribing, I would literally hear something that I hadn't quite heard when we had the conversation or I hadn't quite sank in. So I could go back and like have a second conversation. And also in transcribing, I would also hear what, in a sense, was the most interesting parts of the story. Uh-huh. So that is when the crafting of the story would come to me. So everything is true. It's just that I arranged it in an interesting way. And, you know, the th- thoughts of like, okay, how am I going to start this? And how do I want to tell the story? And do I want to go back and forth? You know, so I guess I would say I applied creative techniques to how uh-huh. I told the story. But everything was was what was told. It was completely nonfiction. Did you go back to them and say, this is what I wrote? Like, is this, nope. you know? No. Nope. Okay. That's nope. smart. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't want to do that. No, I didn't want to do that for a couple of reasons. I think 
you can tell someone your story and not necessarily realize how you come across. Mm -hmm. And you may not come across always in the best light. And that's okay because that's also part of, I think, the truth. And I didn't want people to like try and present themselves like in an angelic fashion, right? Right. And I wanted to show things as they were. So just to give an example, there is one particular story where one of the women really was, I would say, complicit in sexual assault. But that's definitely not how she saw it, right? Or that's, uh-huh. not, I, that's not definitely how she would have seen it. So part of what I did before the book came out was to say to her, you know, this act that happened, that's actually sexual assault. You know, so I wanted to prepare her for that reaction. But I wouldn't have wanted her to have had the chance to edit that out of the story. Right. How Does did that she react? Sense? Yeah, totally. Was she shocked? Yeah, she hadn't seen it that way. You know, she hadn't seen it that way. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Whew. Um, so did they have to sign off on anything or not? They were just like, I agreed to do this interview and that was that. Yes. And what I'll, what I'll do is most of my, in fact, all of the interviews were recorded. So I would ask people, you know, I'll say to them, this is what the book is about. It's a nonfiction book. You can choose to be anonymous or not anonymous, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So you had a record of it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you kind of wrote the stories as you were interviewing these people and how long did that whole process take? And then how did you decide the framing of the three sections and like the construction of the book? Hmm. So the whole process took five years, from 2015 to 2020. It also took five years because I was very much doing it on the side, right? Well, I had Uh a full-time job and I had many, many side hassles, a bit like you, Courtney. Yes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So it took five years just because of that process, not because it needed to take five years. And in terms of how I ordered the stories. There was actually a UK version and there's a US version. Both versions are different. So that's also something that's interesting. Even the stories in each section are different. Yes. Fascinating. It is really interesting. (laughs) Was that requested or how did it, how did you guys decide? I mean, I feel like to a certain extent, books are also put together with the support slash advice slash encouragement of editors, Uh you know? So the very first order that I did, my editor had some particular feedback and that actually in the UK, and that actually made me change the arrangement of the book. So in the very first draft that I myself put together, I actually started the book off with the freedom section. Oh, And when I got her feedback, I was like, hmm, I don't want to change the people I have in the freedom section because for me, these are the people that signify freedom. But what I'll do is I'll move that entire section to the middle. And that addressed, you know, the sort of queries that she had. And then with my U.S. editor, it was a completely different process. So I think, obviously, what you would have seen as the U.S. version. With the U.K. version, so with the U.S. version, my story is kind of threaded. It's a bit threaded all the way through, right? Because you have these sort of slightly longer vignettes, you know, Uh about each woman I'm about to interview. Right. And the UK version, there's a very short blurb about each woman. Oh. Yes. So again, that's different, right? My US editor wanted a bit more of my own story, wanted to know why I chose to interview the woman, how did it like change me, shape me. And so that was the way in which I made those like like I added that extra detail that she was really interested in hearing and she felt a U.S. audience would be interested in hearing. You know what? She's right. Yes. Like I <laughs> I did like those vignettes and like understanding kind of where you were coming from a little bit. Yes. Yes. That's so um, funny. <laughs> yeah. So that was interesting. And like same, same thing. She was like, why is this person in this section? Why is that person in that section? And we had some back and forth, you know, and I made some changes as well in terms of the order in which people's stories appeared in the US version. Yeah. So I actually want to hear from people who have read both to see what they prefer. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Okay. So then you finally finish and you had these like one draft or one pass with each editor. Was that kind of how it went? Yeah. So it was a different process. So the UK version sold way before the US version did, right? 
and what I'm trying to remember, I think I think the US was sold after the UK book was out. Oh. Yes. So it's it's like I finished the book. It was published in the UK. Then my agent sold it in the US. And then I reworked the book for a US audience. Interesting. So did you have two kind of two book tours and it looked like you had a massive t- tour <laughs> situation, but what was it like on your end? <laughs> it feels like it's been one long, continuous book tour, which has never ended. I can't complain. I've been lucky. Yeah, you know, I've actually got fun. really good publicity for my book. Yes, because it was like promoting the UK edition for a really long time. And then the US one came out and then we did a virtual book tour. And now I'm kind of promoting both <laughs> all of the time. And you got a lot of attention. Like what were the kind of the coolest things that you have done during the tour? Oh gosh, so many cool things. So recently, well, not recently anymore. It was in April. I was in Kenya for a festival. I'd been invited to headline a new festival there. And the New York Times correspondent who is based in Kenya, Abdi, Abdi, he reached out to me because he had read the book, loved it, and wanted to interview me. And so I got this really, really cool spread in the New York Times. You know, it made it to the print version. I was the cover story in the book section. And that for me has been a huge highlight. That was a huge highlight. When the book came out in the UK as well, um, one of the most popular newspapers in the UK is The Guardian. And they also have a book magazine. I was the cover of the book magazine and they also had a piece that one of the journalists had done on me. And then they also had Margaret Busby, who is basically credited as being the first Black publisher in the UK. She also did a review of the book. And it was like those three things came out at the same time. And then they'd also sent a photographer to Ghana to do a photo shoot of me. I looked gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there was a shop in the UK, Waterstones, that devoted an entire window to my book. So I have had lots of highlights. Yes, I would say the Guardian coverage, the New York Times coverage, the Waterstones window. The CNN interview I did recently with Christina Mampo. Okay. Those were all Shit. those were all highlights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Incredible. What's next? The book's out. Are you already thinking about the next thing? Have you started anything? Are you kind of just brainstorming? Yes, yes. I have the next thing that I really need to start working on um because I recently signed another deal with my UK publisher for my second hey. book. <laughs> Congrats. So, yes, I'm not feeling the deadline pressure yet, but I, I do need to start pretty soon. Um, and yes. Is there anything you can share about what that one's about? I can say it's also still going to be about sex. I'm describing it as part memoir, part African feminist social commentary. Oh, well, with a heavy dose of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Do you have any bucket list writing goals? Yes. I want to write a historical fiction novel set in pre-colonial Africa. Interesting. Okay. What is one piece of writing advice you wish you could give your former self? Maybe just to have more confidence in myself and just to trust that I am a writer and that I just need to persevere and work at it and that my dreams will come true. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's one tip for writers trying to get a book published? Make writer friends. Just really, you know, I mean, I think community is everything, right? Just make writer friends and be happy for them when they do well and support them because your own time will come. I love that. And it also seemed to me like your blog offered this kind of like wonderful, I don't know, community for you to share your book just from the get. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Completely agree. I think community is everything, whether that's digital or in person or ideally a mix of both. Uh huh. What's your all time favorite piece of your own writing? Apart from the sex lives of African women. (laughs) (laughs) That's definitely my favorite piece of writing for now. Yes, my own book. (laughs) And how can listeners connect with you on the internet? So my happy place is Instagram, 
Um, my handle there is D for Dagma, D F O R D A R K O A. On Twitter, I'm Nas009, Nas like the rapper Nas009 at the end. Yes. And then obviously, people should check out the blog, which is super active, and we always have lots of interesting content. And that's Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. And the URL is adventuresfrom.com. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. And I feel like it's such a nice B-side to our Private Parts Unknown conversation. Absolutely. People need to check out that as well. Thank you so much, Cockney. So that is it for this edition of The Bleeders. Thanks again to Nana. That was so much fun. You should definitely check out her episode of Private Parts Unknown. That is a goodie. Also, if you missed the last episode of The Bleeders, which featured Caroline Shannon Karasik talking about her work in progress, Mother Eaton, make sure to go back and check it out. There was so much good craft talk in that episode. Here is a little preview. But for me right now, it's kind of letting that old stuff sit somewhere else and generate new stuff and and pretend like that doesn't exist because it's really challenging when you already have something that's formatted and then trying to go in it and just like plunk things in that you now want to rewrite. So I'm trying to do the research and then get into my like cut it up and put it on the floor phase and see where things puzzle in. Because for a long time, I kept looking at the manuscript as it was and thinking, how do I rewrite this? How do I begin to really put this new overlay on it. And it was just messing me up. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Bleeders. Ah, writing is so much better with friends. I'm your host, Courtney Kosak, and let's connect on social media. I am at Courtney Kosak, K-O-C-A-K on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you're signed up for The Bleeders Companion Substack, Hot tip, I send out a lot of good stuff in there. The link is in the episode description. And of course, join me again in two weeks for another episode. In the meantime, happy bleeding. <laughs>